film Wait, this. I haven't done that. <laughs> I haven't even... So, one of the things that I think I'm going to start doing is talking at the end of each video about where we're going to go next, or even possibilities of where we're going to go next. Hi. Today's the day we're going to bind those little mats that we quilted last time. I always like to press my work with a lot of steam before I bind it. I like to find a nice flat surface, whether it's on my sewing table, sometimes I use the island in the kitchen, and or the dining room table, and while it's still nice and hot, I set it flat and leave it there to cool and dry. And with wall hangings, I often leave it overnight. Um, this is same thing. It looks like this on the back. And so there are all different kinds of things that I've experimented with, all different kinds of things you can do. I'm just going to cut this out square because I do test my stitching a lot up and down the sides. If I cut off a little bit, I can get rid of that and not end up accidentally having some of those test stitches show. Sometimes it's better, I think, to go ahead and turn your mat because you get a better cut going like this with a big part of your ruler on your mat than doing this and cutting. You're more likely to slip around, you know, if I hadn't turned it and I was working from the other side. I don't really care how big this is, I just want it to be square. Just double checking my size. What we're trying to do is put the art component of our quilt first and it everything else even though we want it to be good quality we want it to wash well if it's a wall hanging we want people to be able to clean it eventually without uh, being very disappointed that their thing is never going to be nice again and so we're taking all those things into account but we want it to be beautiful and artistic. This type of a tight, fused, narrow binding that we're going to do today is the most challenging binding that I know of. If you can master this, you can master any type of binding. We're cutting this on the narrow side. I saw something recently that said to cut these type of bindings two and a half inches. We're going to cut ours one and seven eighths because we're counting on that fusible to hold that nice and tight and we don't want to have a lot of fabric sticking out past our stitching because this is a two-sided piece. Now this is good practice but in real life what I've done is I've moved mostly to one-sided pieces where I add a margin of error and I allow the back to look a little bit sloppy. I'm more concerned about the face of my artwork, like a painting, than I am about the binding looking perfect from the back. We want to make a scarf joint out of our two pieces. One is right side up, the other is right side down. And what you want to think about is when you stitch your line, is it going to be a straight line? And this is not. So we need to stitch it this way. I've done this all kinds of ways. I've eyeballed it and done it fairly crooked and still had the end piece look pretty nice. But then of course you need to compensate for certain things. I've done it where I mark it with chalk or another type of marker and sewn it. I have, um, I've actually even often ironed in this fold and followed that because you may have noticed I I don't bring pins in unless I really need to in many cases. And so whatever we do, whatever we decide we like to do, um, we just don't want to distort all this because the more distortion that we put into it, the more we're going to have to compensate. Which is why for this type of binding, I don't even consider doing it on the bias. 
and because we're doing a double binding I also don't even consider um, using a bias tape maker. All we're going to do with this is join it and then iron it in half and then we're going to put it on the piece. I'm using black thread to do this. On this black binding it's probably the best thing to match your color for this scarf joint. Um, always pull your pins, it's a good idea. You can really mess up the timing on your machine if you hit a pin just wrong. Then trim it. And then we'll take it to the ironing board and iron it in half as quickly as we can. We're going to use this uh, fusible thread that I've been talking about um, in the bobbin. And I'm going to set my stitch as long as it'll go. I'm using my walking foot. This is another time when that's a nice thing to do. And I'm going to start in the middle of the piece. And uh, put my needle down. This helps things stay a little neater. And then because I'm going to do a quarter inch uh, binding, I want to do less than that. And I've sometimes had this show and had to pick it out. And so I'm going to go pretty close to the edge. Really more like an eighth. I really don't want to get very close to that quarter inch line. And I'm just going to stitch, I'm just going to stitch around. Okay, so in reality, I think I would use black thread to do this, but because uh, <laughs> I want you to see what's really going on, I'm using tan thread, which is, you know, the same color that I have in a lot of this quilting. And one thing I always like to do is just kind of get a sense of where my scarf joint is going to fall. And so if you can see what I'm doing, I'm just kind of like here, it's actually really close to the corner and I don't want it like that. So I'm going to move it here and then adjust accordingly. And we want to start not too close to this edge because we need some space to work with in here, which is where we're going to make another scarf joint to finish out this binding and we need a lot of room there because you just need something, uh, you need to get that joint going like this again or I suppose maybe it's like this uh, if it's right sides together. But to do that you don't want to make it too tight because you have to be able to manipulate the fabric and get it going the right direction. Okay so now I have my quarter inch foot on here with the guide that I found and put on there because it really does help. And we're going to start here and we're going to back stitch. We've got now about a two. You know, I'm pretty impatient, so I'll do a two and a half. Needle down and back stitch. I have loosened my presser foot, and so you're a little more responsible for guiding the fabric. Uh, and everything, but that helps you not have so much compression on your piece that really to get through there, it's really making one layer distorted from, pulled further along than the other to where you end up uh, with your piece not being flat because your binding has been stretched out too much as you go. trying to do is have there be a quarter inch between the edge of the piece and where our needle is. And so with this guide it's marked for you and you can you can judge that with a regular foot. You just kind of guesstimate. Most of the things I do I actually don't do a quarter inch. I actually just use the presser foot on my other machine that is a little bit wider than a quarter. I usually call it a quarter but it really isn't. But this we're doing a true quarter because I figured this binding using an actual quarter inch. Okay, now we want to backstitch a couple of stitches. 
Okay. And we're going to pull this out of the machine. And then what we do is we turn this and it makes a miter. And this should be a straight line going. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. This should be a straight line here going all the way up there. And once we have that, then we're going to fold back towards us. And so what you have basically is this little part here that is going to be your miter and you want it folded down and everything should match up. This edge here should match up, this edge here should match up, and this miter in at the diagonal, if you could see it, should actually be right in the center of that. And you get really good at this once you've done it a few times. Um, again, if you make pot holders and you miter corners for Christmas gifts, you're going to get really good at it. And then when you do it on a quilt that you really, really care about, uh, you'll have that skill already. We're going to start out here. I'm not going to go backwards. Yeah. We can go backwards a little, that's a good idea. Okay, here I am again attempting to get just a quarter inch and I think that my stitch is big enough that it's pushing me a little past so I'm actually going to go back just a touch. That's the thing about doing this stuff. If you do it a lot, uh, it all comes back pretty quick. Okay, this is our last corner. And so when we stitch this, Again, we don't want to go very far. We'll go about whatever that is, four inches. Back stitch a little so we don't end up having that pull out on us a lot. I kind of do this. If you can see what I've done, I try to have it flat and right where it's going to need to be sewn to make that joint. And then I folded one piece back and I lay the other piece over it. And then, and this isn't going to be exact because you've got the thickness of this fabric, but then I do a little bit of a miter myself right there. And then I take my scissors and cut this, and I usually don't have my good scissors. I usually have <laughs> whatever little trimming scissors are laying around. Usually they're not sharp. But so now I've cut those approximately where they need to be. And so now my job is going to be to create the proper scarf joint. And, and so this is going to be sort of like this. And again, this is where finger pressing can really come in handy. But you do want to be careful that you're not really distorting that a lot. Because again, the more it stretches out on you, the more trouble you're going to have with it when you're trying to get it to look right. Now this one needs to go like this. So I'm going to kind of finger press this like that. When they're sewn together, they should be like that. And you can see that they're not right matching up on the seam line, that one is a little bit longer than the other. And so I think when I, this is where you need that slack. And sometimes it's easiest to just take this. 
you know, it's pretty reasonable with a little thing like this, but if this were a big wall quilt, um, or any kind of quilt, um, then you've got a lot of bulk that you're dealing with. But so we're going to take this, and it's got to mate with that, and if that's not going to be right, let's see, I confuse myself every time. goes like this and I'm gonna attempt to pin this so it's just a little part of the ends but pin it in the right spot okay so let's see if I if I sew this like that, can you tell that uh, once this part is trimmed out of there, that this is going to be a pretty decent fit? And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this, just to make it easy on myself, I'm going to uh, repin this just to keep it out of my way. You can only get so far using uh, your kids' chalk, their sidewalk chalk and their other chalk. Sometimes it helps to just go and find a piece of Taylor's chalk. So I'm going to, again, I've done this so many different ways, uh, some of them much better than others, but I'm just gonna try to mark this with this sharp piece of Taylor's chalk in a way that I can actually sew it in the right place. And then I'm going to repin it the proper direction for sewing. Okay, so here we are at the machine that is loaded up with black thread. And I'm just going to stitch this. So that actually is going to work, I think, pretty well. Um, I still need to trim it. I'm still trying not to stretch it out really bad. School started, so now I really don't have a camera girl. And of course, when I put those together, it was right sides together. Try to finger press this without really stretching it. Okay. So now I'm going to press this, and I am going to try to press this little part a little bit with the tip of my iron, but I don't want to put any extra creases in this. And then I'm going to press it like this. And I may be just a little bit long. see that I'm a little bit out of shape, but this is where that compensation comes in. Where if it doesn't line up perfectly along this edge, we still want to stitch it so that we're consistent on this part. Because what we're going to do is turn this like this. You see that? We're going to turn this like this and iron it. And then that's going to turn under and then we're going to stitch it. And when we do that, we're going to be pressing onto this fusible. Again, as I stitch this, where I want my consistent line to be is along this part, because that's the part that's going to turn over. And so I can actually take my Taylor's chalk and my clear ruler. If you don't have one of these this size, you might think about getting one. I use mine a lot for this type of thing. And then I'm just going to mark down this line. Because if I stitch along there, no matter what's going on over here, I'm going to get pretty consistent. 
And I'm not sure I marked that perfectly, but if I wear my glasses, I might be able to see what I'm doing. All right, that's about as good as it's going to get for me. Okay, so I'm going to stitch this now. And I'm just going to overlap rather than back sew. So. Now I've got a little bit of extra ruffle here, so I'm going to try to get this feed in there. end up with too much of a pucker. Okay. Let's see. Doesn't look perfect, but let's press it and see if we can get it to look pretty good. So we're going to work on this hardest area first. You just try to press it down, get it to submit, and then we're going to press in all of our corners a little bit and press all this out. We don't want to do too much because we don't want to start activating that fusible. Do you see my fusible is right there? That's what I'm trying to hook to when I do this next step. It works best I think coming from the outside watch your steam, you can really get yourself. I might turn mine down for this. So see how this is attaching there? And I can pull it off, but I don't want to pull it off. I want to have it stuck there just long enough to sew it. See how that is? It's in there and I can move it and then repress it because it'll remelt and stick on there because I'm trying to get my edge nice and straight. And then we'll deal with the corners once we get the bulk of these edges in place. Now we want to do a little miter here. And when we stitch, we're going to stitch from the right side and we're going to come this way. And so we want to be on the top of the miter first. And then and then come down here so we don't have to go up. We're coming off of a hump of fabric instead of onto one. And so we're going to go in this direction. Should have done a bigger one. This is tiny. Okay. Get away from that steam. Turn it all the way off. All right. And I'm going to put one pin. to hold that. Okay, and then I'm going to do all four corners. Now we're going to stitch in the ditch and I'm going to use my edger foot and I like to kick over one needle position. This is one of those times when I'm going to go ahead and drop my stitch size down really tiny and do a few, quite a few really tiny stitches and then I'm going to go back to a normal size stitch for top stitching about a two and a half close to a three. Like I said I'm, I'm impatient and then I'm going to stitch this. 
I don't like to stitch in the ditch right on the line because then it goes up and then it goes off and, and I don't like that look. I like to go over one needle position. Go back to my tiny little stitches. Okay, so here's this side. It's got the scarf joint that we had to do in place. And you can see my stitching is not perfect. And there's a little bit of uh, overhang here that's not supposed to be there. This side, it's, it's all attached but it also isn't perfect all the way through. And there's this side, and there's this side. But you can see that with a little practice, you could get a pretty nice binding, a pretty nice, uh, stitch in the ditch, your top side uh, will look beautiful and if you work a little bit on doing that second scarf joint uh, you can get this whole thing with matching thread to look really really nice. One of the items that I want to make sure and post a tutorial for before the Christmas sewing season which is fast approaching, it's a cold fall day in Helena, Montana today um, is this rice pack that I've been making for quite a while and it's just one of those nice things that you can microwave as a heat pack or put in a plastic ziplock in the freezer and use it as an ice pack and it's a great thing to give to people as a Christmas gift not so much for mailing because I think it is pretty close to three pounds of rice um, but a nice thing with these channels that keep uh, control of the rice and so it will stay on the back of your neck instead of all sliding down to the ends like in an old sock. Also the apples that I showed in the chili pepper video and then something that I was thinking about doing next, this is a very old bag that I made out of a wall hanging that I didn't like and I carried it for a long time and as you can see it's pretty worn. I've even, this was good quality quilting fabric and I even wore through the straps. I carried this for so long. But the neat thing about this bag, besides just the fact that it's got the watercolor technique and the buttons and thread sketching and quilting and um, couching around the edges and those kinds of te techniques, but the really fun part is that on the inside it has a pair of uh, jeans. And this just happened because I wanted to make this wall hanging I didn't like into a tote for myself. And my husband had an old pair of jeans that I asked him if I could have. I actually didn't want him to wear them anymore. And um, so this happened and of course my friends thought it was great and I started selling them. And then a few years later I was making them like this and these, this is a stencil that I cut myself with uh, painting and stitching on it as well and some metallic threads and different threads in the quilting and it has a very similar strap the top is a little different and it has this is the only one that I ever made that didn't have Levi's in it you could use really any jean that you were comfortable working with but um, I kept this one for myself I made a deal that if it didn't sell by the end of the Christmas season I would keep it for myself and so I did and carried this one for a while I'm not currently carrying it it's kind of a fun thing and so if anyone is interested in learning how to make these bags let me know I have as of today 117 subscribers if 17 people contact me in one way or another and say count me in I want to know about that I will make whatever, however many it takes for us to get through it. I'd like to post videos that are under 20 minutes and I'll do it in the same style that I'm doing and um, we'll just work on it. We might take a break from the big project to, to do the apple or the rice mitt between now and Christmas. 
but I think it would be fun to see how it shapes up if we do a big project. So if you do let me know that you want to do the bag, please note whether you want to do the color wash version where we do the little pieces or whether you want to do the stencil version where you cut your own stencil. These I called artichokes. Um, and then learn how to paint that and heat set it and all that good stuff. And maybe we'll do both versions, but we'll have to see what, uh, what happens. Thanks.